My name is Sam Vatnin and I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited. The crisis that started in 2008 is a banking crisis and it is still going strong. Banks all over the world over leveraged their capital and extended loans unwisely to the undeserving. American financial institutions lent money to homeowners who could not pay it back, buried as they were under mountains of debt. European banks lavish funds on countries such as Greece and Italy, which were technically insolvent or illiquid owing to low economic growth and bloated public sectors. Chinese banks were coerced into bankrolling near-bankrupt state-owned enterprises and municipalities. Consequently, China's financial crisis is imminent, as is the collapse of the municipal bond markets in the West. Thus, what appear to be disjointed economic crises are actually manifestations of a single cancerous phenomenon, the avarice, recklessness and inanity of banks. And the solution? To nationalize all major banks, starting this coming November 2011. The sovereign debt phase of the banking crisis, which started in 2010, emanated from the realization that lower growth rates throughout the industrialized West were insufficient to guarantee the repayment of debts accumulated by governments. The proceeds of the credits and loans assumed by public sectors throughout Europe and the United States were plowed into successive futile attempts to stimulate ailing economies and avert banking crisis and panics. Banks are the most unsafe institutions in the world. Worldwide, hundreds of them crash every few years. Three decades ago, the US government was forced to invest hundreds of billions of dollars in the savings and loans industry. Multi-billion dollar embezzlement schemes were unearthed in the much fitted BCCI, wiping both equity capital and deposits. Barings Bank, having weathered 330 years of tumultuous European history, succumbed to a bout of untrammeled speculation by a rogue trader. In 1890, this very same bank faced the very same predicament, only to be salvaged by other British banks, including the Bank of England. But they never learned. Bankers never learn. The list is interminable. There were more than 30 major banking crises this century alone, in the 20th century. I mean. The banks are very risky, and that is proven by the inordinate number of regulatory institutions which supervise banks and their activities. The USA sports a few organizations which insure depositors against the seemingly inevitable vicissitudes of the banking system. The FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, insures against the loss of every deposit up to a certain amount. The HLSIC insures depositors in saving houses in a similar manner. Other regulatory agencies supervise banks, audit banks, or regulate banks. It seems that you cannot be too cautious where banks and bankers are concerned. The very word bank is derived from the old Italian word banca bench or counter. Italian bankers used to conduct their business on benches. Nothing much changed since then. Well, maybe with the exception of the scenery. Banks hide their fragility and vulnerability, or worse, behind marble walls. The American president, Andrew Jackson, was so set against banks that he dismantled the nascent Central Bank of the United States, the second bank of the United States. Banks institutions where miracles happen regularly. We rarely entrust our money to anyone but ourselves and our banks. Despite a very checkered history of mismanagement, corruption, false promises and representations, delusions and behavior inconsistency, banks still succeed to motivate us to give them our money. Partly it is the feeling that there is safety in numbers. The fashionable term today is moral hazard. The implicit guarantees of the state and of other financial institutions, move us to take risks which we would otherwise have avoided. And partly it is the sophistication of the banks in marketing and promoting themselves and their products. Glossy brochures, professional computer and video presentations, and vast 
shrine-like real estate complexes. All these serve to enhance the image of the banks as the temples of the new religion of money. In the wake of the Great Recession of 2008, a crisis largely of the financial system, the multinational Basel Committee and the group of central bank governors and heads of supervision, comprised of central bankers, banking supervisors and regulators, more than double the amount of equity Tier 1 capital banks must have. Now, it stands at 2%. The new regulations call for 4.5%. Another 2.5% of the bank's assets must be held in an equity conservation buffer, buffer to be amortized and deployed in case of emergency. Banks which resort to the buffer must, however, augment their capital by any legal means possible. For instance, by not distributing dividends, by divesting known core assets, or by issuing new stock. Yet another 1.5% of the balance sheet must be held in less than equity, equity investment, or investment vehicles. And the total leverage ratio must never go below 3% of equity. And that's admittedly a very liberal number. Moreover, regulators can impose the equivalent of yet another 2.5% in risk-weighted assets, including off-balance sheets assets, such as derivatives, in the form of a counter-cyclical buffer. This is intended to compensate for or counter the pro-cyclical nature of most capital and reserve requirements and regimes. The thing is that the higher asset prices go, in other words, the bigger the asset bubble and the commensurate risks, the less the capital required of banks, the, the fewer the reserves, the smaller the reserves. So as assets inflate in price, banks put aside less and less money. As they decline in price, they put aside more and more money. This is pro-cyclical. It encourages uh, busts and booms. And this is, of course, exacerbated by bankers, whose compensation is often tied to their institution's short-term performance. The Basel III regime has to be fully implemented by 2019, and that's a concession to undercapitalized banking sectors in various EU members, notably Germany. Ironically, the Basel Committee was created in 1974, following the failure of a German bank and an ensuing near collapse of the currency markets. The Basel regime is as strong as its weakest link, multilateralism as its price. This inbuilt frailty in the new regime forces the committee to remain vague on what constitutes capital, on disclosure regarding derivatives, and on the loaded issue of subordinated debt versus corporate bonds. Subordinated debt would force banks to become a lot more transparent and is likely to foster shareholder activism. So they prefer, of course, corporate bonds.